And I had my dad teach me this little simple story. He said, it's a powerful story, but he said, son, if you work for the man, his quotes, if you work for the man, you'll forever be beholden for, to the man. But if you mm. are a business owner, you can set your own destiny. Mm. And whenever I was turning 15 years old, he said, son, I need you to have a job. Your last name is Goodbread. No one's ever going to forget that name. And if you don't <laughs> have a job by Friday, don't come home. Hey, everybody, welcome back to the Exit Is Now podcast with me, your host, Scott Snyder, hanging out with one of my favorite people, without doubt. Uh, he is back for a second time in our uh, on our podcast, Justin Goodbread. Welcome. Welcome Thanks, to Scott. the show. Thanks for having Fresh me. off an airplane and right into the studio. I, I, lo- I, I love it. And so, you know, Justin was coming to town, and I said I couldn't record a, a, a podcast episode without him, with, with, with him leaving, without him leaving, or whatever that is. And when I thought about Justin, we he was on, I, I believe, season one of the podcast and like episode two. I think I had interviewed my dad and then I had you and Sean were the next logical people when we were putting together the podcast on. But we primarily talked about your role as advisors inside of the exit planning space and what at the time we were calling this evolution of exit planning. But you're a, a multi-time exited business owner, which for me, being a lifelong business owner is, is super fascinating. And then how you bring in your business owner perspective with your advisor perspective, you're a certified exit planning advisor. Uh, You're a two-time author of one of my favorite books, Your Baby's Ugly, right? (laughs) And uh, you're an award-winning advisor and certainly award-winning SEPA. So what's always cool for me, because I think we have similar mentalities where we combine this educator-advisor mentality with a business owner mentality. So I want to take some of that and and unpack it and talk about it today. And I want to start start with you today as as a business owner and walk this exit path that, that you've been on for, what, 20 years? 30 years now. 30 years now. So take me back 30 years ago when you started your first company. Let's start there. Yeah, you know, you, most people, if they've heard any of my training, they'll hear me say something like, if I had to be a financial advisor, I'd move to Idaho, stick a fork <laughs> in my eye, and sell llamas. <laughs> yeah, because it's always <laughs> like an aha moment for me because I'm like, I don't know if that's a good or bad thing <laughs> sitting in the SEPA program, but it does get to who you are, though. That's correct. Right? It, it points to the fact that I'm a business owner first. Mm-hmm. I was trained by my parents to be a business owner, believe it or not. So I was homeschooled back when homeschooling wasn't popular. Really? I'm 45 years old now. Okay. So this is 30 years ago. I was 15 years old. Yep. Dude, I can remember going to hear <laughs> Zig Ziglar. Les Brown, <laughs> Og Mendino, yeah. Charlie Tremendous Jones on stage, reading their books, reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad as my very first book ever, mm. and learning this entrepreneur mindset. And I had my dad teach me this little simple story. He said, it's a powerful story, but he said, son, if you work for the man, his quotes, if you work for the man, you'll forever be beholden for, to the man. But if you mm. are a business owner, you can set your own destiny. Mm. And whenever I was turning 15 years old, he said, son, I need you to have a job. Your last name is Goodbread. No one's ever going to forget that name. And if you don't have a job by Friday, don't come home. Dude, think about this. Yeah, Here I am homeschooled. Yeah. Dad's you can't like, drive, though, right? I can't drive. He's like, you don't have a job. <laughs> you riding home. your bike around? I don't know, yeah. Seriously. But he takes it a step further. He yeah. says, but you can't work for fast food. You can't work for a grocery store. And you can't work for anybody I know. So here I am, born and raised mm. in South Georgia, Brunswick, Georgia, at the time, 35, 40,000 people. My dad, the good bread name, is a not, a not a common name. My dad was a good man. He had an unbelievable reputation. People knew him. Hmm. So he started this idea in my life of, hey, I can build a business. Hmm. So our very first business, just like yours, was that of a landscape company, yeah. right? Yeah, man. <laughs> landscape yep. in parentheses. Love that. You know, it was, it was me, my dog, Radar, was an English bird dog sitting in a Chevy truck, and my brother <laughs> with a snapper lawnmower and a weed eater in the yeah, back of the exactly. truck. Right? Yeah. That's what we started off yeah. at. At least you had a truck, man. I had a Ford Taurus <laughs> sedan. So awesome. I couldn't drive either. My buddy Mike drive, drove before me. So I said, hey, let your dad use his car on Saturdays. And I'll let my dad use the lawn, the home, the you know, the Snyder family lawnmower. Yep. We'll put it in the back of, like, we had to quite literally bungee cord the truck down. 
and we, you know, we were going to landscape, you know, mow lawns and yep. lay mulch. And we'd roll up in a car to lay mulch, taking shovels out of the back seat and yep. stuff. But yeah, man, I totally you, get you, where you're at. I remember one time I pulled up to the red light and I hit the gas too hard. The whole back of the truck emptied in the middle of the interse- <laughs> yeah. intersection. Yeah. Here I am, 16 years old, lawnmower, weed eater, yeah. rake, shovels. It's like your whole business this is right sitting there. there. <laughs> like, oh, no. It's like, oh, crap. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you know, so that was, the, that was the start of what my entrepreneur journey began. And that little company grew and it grew um, until I was 22 years of age. We ended up having multi-employees. We had multi-million dollars of revenue. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a sizable business. And then Emily came in my life. You've met my wife. Yes. She is she is everything to okay. me. You know this. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, Emily's half Filipino. And I never dealt with racism, Scott, until she came in my life. Hmm. And I saw an ugliness that I'd never seen out of humans before. And we made a decision that we're not going to raise our family in that particular area of the country at that particular time. Good or bad, that's what our decision was. So we moved back to Knoxville, Tennessee. So I sold that company for a five-figure exit at 22 years of age and left. Now, if I'd known what I know now as an exit planning, I could have got six figures plus out of this company, right? Yeah, likely, yeah. But, um, it and was you t- were what, 22, 23 22, now? 22, 22 years 23, old, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's a big decision, though, man, moving out of your hometown. And you grew up there pretty much your whole life. Born and raised. But Emily was from Knoxville, and her yep. parents, were, you know, they had a big, a big Filipino culture there in that, in that part of the country, and it made more sense for me to leave my family and put her back into what she's comfortable with versus changing her cultural dynamics of her family as radical as mm, it had changed. Yeah, surely. So we, we sold the company. We sold okay. the company, moved to Tennessee. And then, you know, I was like, I'm going to start a landscape company in Knoxville. <laughs> if you've ever been to the rocket, the, the mountains of East Tennessee, you can take a pickaxe and a shovel and not break the dirt. <laughs> yeah. You cannot dig yeah. In, yeah. in the dirt. Yeah. So I'm like, this is, I'm not doing this. I'm not yeah. jumping on a shovel. So I was recruited into American Express Financial Advisors after that. Hmm. And that led into my insurance career that later sold. Right. Okay. So then, so is that what? So you start that business? Or so what do you do? There's Because you said there's a, there's exits that, that are in between all of this too, right? Yeah. So I had, I've had seven exits in my career. We'll talk about the most recent yeah. two here because they, they kind of pivot to where I'm at now and what I'm enjoying now. Yeah. But yeah, so we moved to Tennessee and I was recruited to come into Ameriprise. And that led into a, a, a financial planning career, if you want to say it, but sure. it was more insurance, insurance based. Sales, yeah. And um, about 2009 or so, I ended up selling that book of business through a business separation, if you will. And okay. I kind of got to leave it at that. Yeah. So I went through a business separation, sold that book. And during that time period, I also started a company called Dental Management Group, which is where I was helping okay. dentists buy new practices, change the practices, think about value acceleration, yeah. take it from somebody else's name, make it into their name, whatever they wanted the company to be, and then rapidly grow that company. So here I am doing value acceleration, if you will, today's yeah. vernacular, right. for yeah. dentists all over the country. And it was fun, and I had a team in place, had infrastructure. It was like my side hustle, right? Yeah, okay. I mean, the side hustle <laughs> yeah, producing yeah. multi hundreds of thousands of yeah, dollars a year in revenue. Yeah, so interesting, man. Ended up selling that one um, in the midst of, you know, I sold my landscape company, sold the dental management group, sold um, a book of business through mm-hmm. a insurance company. And yep. then, you know, I'm sitting, I'm sitting in um, – I'm sitting in, in Minnesota. I'm like, you know, there's a way to build a financial planning practice that's more consultative, consultative mm-hmm. than, yeah, cons- yeah. than, than commission-based. And at that time, the world that we worked in was still commission-based. We actually Absolutely. had this account called Fee in Lieu of Commission that the regulators mm-hmm. ended up just canceling. Yeah. So it was, it was a very interesting time in the, in the financial services industry. So I launched this company called Heritage Investors. And yeah. it was still using like variable annuities, things of this nature, because that's kind of was in place that a share mutual funds. And I had a, I had a client, the guy I talk about Steve, yep. who was on the top of the West Virginia mountains and he's in tears. And he says, I'm broke. Mm. And he's like, I, I, all I have is all I have is this equipment. I got two and a half million dollars of bulldozers and track codes and excavators and everything else. But I'm broke, dude. I got 200 grand in my name. He said, like, I want to retire. I'm like, okay. Well, and whenever you're sitting at that moment, if you got 200 grand, I'm sitting in the financial world, there's not much I can do for 200 grand, but I'm like, dude, I know what I've done in business. Let me figure out a framework and we can take your company and we can scale your company. I know how to take what you have and make it valuable. I just need to get a little bit of education. Mm. 
So yeah. now I'm in Chicago, right? Yeah. I'm in Chicago SEPA program. SEPA really? program. Yeah. Absolutely. This yeah. is kind of the story. Yeah, this is it, you man. That's so I'm crazy. sitting in the SEPA program. And I don't know if you were there, but I know your dad was there. I don't remember if you were in my class, but yeah. your, your dad was there and there was a presenter on a Friday. At the time, there was like some marketing education on a Friday. Yeah, there was. Yeah, yeah. And I had paid for that extra module to see how marketing worked at SEPAs. And I'm sitting there literally marketing, right? I'm in the classroom and this young lady's doing her good job. Yep. And she was getting pushback from the room. Like, like, and they were, I call them a bunch of old cats yeah. at the time. Like, yeah. this won't work. This won't right. work. And I literally, I'm like, hey, guys. Why y'all are sitting here fussing about what won't, work, what won't work? I'm already doing what she's talking about, and I got 12 leads sitting here in the last hour. That room went quiet. Doom. Oh, I'm sure, right? But you're also still the, like the young guy in the room, right? Yeah, so I think they're probably nervous at the time, too, of what the, the unknown, right? Because oh, yeah. they don't, there's, you're a little progressive you know, coming into the SEPA program kind of at a young age, too, because you might have been more open to new techniques. Perhaps. Yeah, and also my personality. You know me. I mean, well, yeah. I'm high intensity yeah, all the time. Yeah, that's you know? an easy one. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So exactly. put put me in that room and those. It was like, and then Chris, uh, your dad said, yeah. "That's interesting. I want to talk with you." And afterwards, hmm. I said, "Chris, and we had a conversation." And I can remember a conversation point that that he made to me. He said to me that day, he said, "Justin, exit planning is good business planning." Joe Stadari says yeah, the yeah, same thing. Yeah. I was like, "Man, that's interesting." So here's what that day did for me. Whenever mm-hmm. I tell the students that eggs EPI changed yeah. my life, yeah. I mean it. Yeah. Because I left Chicago, went back to my little financial planning firm. It was December, uh, in December of 2017, walked away from a quarter million dollars of recurring revenue. Mm. Okay. Yep. Now think about this. I'm in my late 20s, yeah. early yeah. 30s at that time. I forget it. I don't know how yeah. old. Do the math. Walked yeah. away from a quarter, <laughs> quarter million dollars of revenue, started with five clients, less than Six million dollars of AUM. So for the financial advisors, that's less than what? So if you do one percent of that, yeah. sixty thousand dollars a year in revenue, total revenue, and I have one employee. Mm. I then started applying business principles from the previous 15, 20 years and exit planning methodologies. And then I you saw what I did. I started studying everything possible. Entered in Heritage Investors, this new brand. Financially Simple, my marketing company, and ultimately for Heritage, and, Heritage, uh, Heritage Business Advisors. 48 months later, on December the 31st, 2021, I inked a sale for eight figures, mostly cash. Yeah. 48 months later, dude. Yeah. So to go from <laughs> yeah. a landscaper who born on a dirt road yeah. to a classroom in Chicago, hearing the methodologies, taking business acumen, saying, you know, I can do this. And here we are, man. It's, it's, some, it's some journey. Here. Yeah, it's been man. fun. So. So take me back to kind of each one of these big exits, right? So from a business owner's perspective, so you go like 15 to 22 in the landscaping company, still pretty young. That's when I, I exited my landscaping company at 24. Uh, what were some of the things that you learned at the, at the first step, the first kind of big run at being an entrepreneur back then in your late teens and early 20s? Wow. What strikes you? Um, there's a couple of lessons. Remember, I was homeschooled. So my, most yeah. of my life lessons came either from books, okay. from my instructors, or my parents. Right. And there's some lessons that I that now make up my core values. That okay. Hopefully my New York Times bestselling book I'm working on right now. Yeah. It's, it's 12, my 12 personal values. And I learned in business that, that business is not hard. It's not hard. There's two things. You have basically revenue and operations or what we would call today the multiple, right? Yep. The, the intrinsic value. The, really all there is to business. Most of the world focuses on sales, and we have to sell. We have to be able to put a product out there, a service out there to the right customer, to the right marketplace who wants our product to where they don't feel like they're being sleazy, but they're willing to provide a solution for them. So mm-hmm. that I remember mom saying, son, you're not selling like Justin Goodbread and Grant Goodbread. You're selling. They need their yard clean. Clean it to the best you can possibly clean it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, man, there was a sales opportunity, right? Yep, yep. So she made this, she used to make the statement, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your heart. And this actually comes from scripture. Whatever your hand yeah. finds to do, do it with all your heart. It's to the Lord, not to men. She's like, is this mm-hmm. the best you can do? And she'd make the statement, if you were standing before the president of the United States, when he walked on this landscape, would you present this to him? So one of my primary lessons I've learned in business, and I still talk about it because I'm just simple mind in my, yeah. in my personality, yeah. is yeah. do the best you can. And that's all you can do is, is whatever the service is, whatever the product is, make sure you're doing your, your jam up. So I remember that one very clearly. I have a similar one. It's interesting to like unpack stories with you because it's, it's very similar. So my dad taught me about business too, right? Really at the time when I started mine, he was still kind of a corporate guy and then went into his story, right? His flex story when he was in yep. small business and, and grew that business with Andy 
from 90 million to 250 million. So still pretty huge, yep. but, but, uh, and then kind of worked his way down into, and then his, his own consulting business. So he was always a huge mentor to me in my business. He was also the bank at first. Cause yep. once we graduated outside of that car, I still had no, you know, I didn't have a lot of fi- like a lot of credit, if any. So, uh, I took a loan with dad to get a truck and an actual like small commercial mower, uh, to make it happen. So dad is always that, that for me from, 15 to 24 dad was kind of always around and mentoring but from to your point like your childhood and being homeschooled and and then my childhood there was one thing that really sticks for me when people ask me that same question about you know what what lessons did you learn in that small that's that time in your life dad always said maybe similar to what your mom was talking about attitude and trying right have a good attitude and do it with all that, that you can that you can do. As long as you and he would say that about school. As long as you have a good attitude, trying you're you're trying hard. I'm not gonna ride your ass as much yep. as I I might if you're not yep. right. And that for me was something that stood out because our motto at M and S Connection Landscaping was keeping your yard green and clean, like mm-hmm. caring, right? Yep. At showing up with a smile, a great attitude, and caring. We with that mentality so has, has, has stuck with us. We actually did. We molded our business into high image oriented properties, yep. right? So people that use their image to sell whatever their service was inside of the building, like a nursing home right. or a, an assisted living center. And so uh, being very community oriented myself and with this kind of attitude and trying mentality in, in mind, we would put uh, like uh, gardening programs inside of the nursing homes and we would build planter boxes real high so they could just roll their wheelchair out and they could work on plants and stuff and it became a whole gardening program. So I was never losing that contract, right? That's awesome. And we did that kind of stuff just to give back to the community. So we would actually earn that contract at a higher price point because we're the green and clean guys yep. and we're the guys community oriented because now all of their residents there and their kids are out there on Mother's Day and stuff and they're like, who did this? They're like, oh, there's a little sign, m s Connection Landscaping. Oh, I have a medical practice, and I want people to feel good when they walk in. And to your point, like your mother said, would, it, would you let the president walk on this lawn, right? So similar kind of mentality yeah. that I think helped us build those smaller companies at the, at the time as young men. Yeah, we were, we, my dad and I, I tell the story from stage often whenever I'm speaking because yeah. I love this story. It impacted my life just like your father's story yeah. there did. We're walking down a barbed wire fence through the woods of Georgia, right? Yeah. And my dad sees this little box turtle, a little small turtle, yeah. upside down. Yeah. And I'm walking beside him, and he reaches down, and he turns the turtle over. And I don't know why I asked the question, Scott. I'm like, hey, Pops. That's what we call my dad. Mm-hmm. I said, hey, Pops, why'd you turn the turtle over? And he stopped. He goes, because I can. I said, no, no, no. But why did you turn it? What made you turn it over? He said, because I can I said, no, no, you're missing the point. He said, no, you're missing the point, son, because I have it in my power to help something, and it doesn't cost me a lot of time, doesn't cost me a lot of energy, sets a higher bar. Mm -hmm. It's the same as in your your landscaping story with your same principles. It sounds like your parents raised as as I was raised on, which is whatever your hands find to do, do it with the best of your abilities. Go over and above what you contracted. Between that, Scott, my dad's story about you're a good bread. No mm-hmm. one's ever going to forget that name, so we'll keep your name yeah. pure. Yeah. Dude, that to me has been the ethos. And I have 12 values all together, but those two are probably my, my mm-hmm. ethos. So what crafted the success, if you will, of my journey. I would say I think that's pretty hardcore of your dad, too, to say don't. I like, I'm, you don't use our name to go get a oh, job, yeah. right? Don't oh, use yeah. me to go get a job. Because I was thinking we lived in a little, probably a community twice as big as the one you described. Uh, and, but, and my dad wasn't necessarily a, 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 like a well tied in, like Strongsville, Ohio is where I grew up, Strongsville, Ohio community guy, but he was tied into the business world. Right. So I could have easily gone and walked the shop floor at, for Andy, for Andy Rayburn on, at Flexloy. Right. He, I could have easily went over to my uncle Mark and his, my dad's older brother and swept floors in his construction company. And he said, you can't use me to get that job. So when I went to high school, I was a janitor. I, <laughs> I was started as a classroom cleaner. I only had like one job, right? So St. Ed's, where I went to school, you could be a classroom cleaner as a freshman. And then from there, I did like really uh, like thorough work. So Russell, who was the director of janitorial services, uh, said, hey, do you want to actually join the janitorial staff as you move into, you know, be a sophomore or whatever? And I, just, I didn't really ask what it was about. I was just like, oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, I get a card. I get like a $2 an hour raise. Like it was a big deal back then, right? Yeah. 
And um, and I thought it was cool. I got one of those like zip up, you know, things with my name on it, right? And like a push cart with a mop on the front. That job lasted about two weeks before I started pushing a mower because that was a dirty job. St. Ed's was an all boys high school. Oh, wow. And once my friends knew I cleaned the bathrooms and the hallways of like the west wing of the school, the after school toilets were pretty full. I bet. And so it was pretty it was pretty bad. So now let's go to let's go fast forward back to the big exit that is more recent, right? You said what, 2021? 2021. 20, has it been that long? It has. That's wild. It's crazy, man. isn't it? And it was like kind of COVID-ish too, right? You're yeah. still kind of in that pandemic. Yeah. So were you approached for that? Was was Heritage up for sale? Were you actively trying to exit? You know, one of the things that we teach through EPI throughout the various principles is uh, the preparing ourselves, the third leg of the stool, right? Preparing yeah. for that, you know, not only do we have personal financial planning, business planning, but also the, the what or the why or mm -hmm. how, et cetera, that third leg is going to come into play. And so during COVID, like everybody dealt with, you know, Tennessee was a little bit more loose than some other parts of the country. Mm -hmm. And so we stayed open, which was kind of nice, but for us, it didn't change much. We live on a farm. We, you sure. know, I'm remote. We already kind of had a remote business where we were working with consulting business owners, yeah. et cetera. And Emily got sick. Mm. You know, like, like, you know, Emily's yeah. my love, yeah. right? You told me. And yeah. when she started developing some problems, I'm not going to get to it today, but at that time, we honestly had to make a life or death decision. Mm. And it was, hey, Emily's going to have this surgery and there's a 12% success rate. So make sure you have your life in order. So here I am for six, eight, nine, 12 weeks working with my wife in the hospital. The company is growing. I'd already mm -hmm. decentralized myself from the company. It could work without me. Interesting. And Emily is sitting there mm -hmm. in the hospital. And this is not a pompous thing. You know me well enough. And I hope, I hope the listeners know me sure. about this, that I'm not a prideful. I try to be very humble. I try. And, but Emily's sitting in the hospital and she said, Justin, what's another million dollars going to do for us? Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, none of that matters, Emily. And she said, do you truly love what you do? You know, I think with each exit, with each particular exit, there's a stigma on the business owner that we failed. Mm. That, hey, the reason we got to get out of companies is because we are tired. Yes. We, we, aren't re we don't want to do it anymore. We're a failure. We can't pass it down to our kids. We can't do it. And I wanted to, I'm sitting here in the hospital with her laying literally what we thought was her deathbed. Now, thank yeah. God, by the way, yeah. she's healthy today. Yeah. God, I mean, just yeah. unbelievable. She's, she's, she's hanging amazing. out with you in Key West. Oh, yeah. She, we, <laughs> yeah. We're having fun, yeah. right? We're living life. She was at the summit this yeah, year. I mean, yeah. yeah, she, yeah. She's, and she's, yeah. she's my rock. Yeah. But we're sitting in that hospital, and I'm sitting there, and I'm looking at the financials of the company. And I'm saying, look at my return on equity right now. If this was a stock and I was up this percentage of value on, and it was providing this dividend, I would tell somebody to sell it. You would sell. I would sell. Right. And it's interesting because you're already, for the listeners, listen to what he just said there. He's thinking about his business as an asset in a portfolio. He's not tied necessarily to like the operating entity necessarily. It's not likely your biggest asset, like we always say, but you're looking, you just said you're looking and you're saying, at, what's weird too, because you're also a financial advisor, mm -hmm. so you understand so if you were advising yourself, you'd say sell. I'd say sell. So I'm sitting in the hospital. Emily makes this statement. She goes, Justin, what's another million, million dollars going to do for me? And at the time, I had a, an advisor on my team, and he said, Justin, if you had unlimited time mm. and unlimited resources, not money, resources, what would you do tomorrow that you're not doing today? So these two powerful statements in this financial report that I'm getting from my, from my team, and I'm watching the business, and I'm going, oh, my goodness. I have an asset here that is highly valuable that I could have at my age at that time of 42, I could have time in front of me, health in front of me, and now significant money in my pocket. Why in the <laughs> world would I not capitalize on this particular exit? And I can't get into the financial data, but I'm sure. telling you, anybody who looked at the numbers would say, you'd be a fool not to sell. Yeah, it's time. So I'm sitting there in the hospital and I call my coach. So I've had a coach. coach. I have currently have five coaches. Yep. I've had a coach my whole business career. And I called him and I said, my wife just said this, this person said this. And he said, you need to exit your company. And I said, but I, I, there's so much more. He goes, your heart's not going to be 100% in it, Justin Goodbread. And unless your heart, you, Justin Goodbread, unless you're laser focused on moving something, you're not going to focus mm -hmm. on that. You're going to watch your value diminish. Right. No matter how much you try to turn over somebody else, you're still pushing behind the scenes. Go ahead and sell, do your earn out, and then 
think about 3.0 for your case in my yeah, life. Yeah, in your life, yeah. So I put the feeler out to my coach. I said, hey, this is what's happening. My wife said this. My coach said, let me introduce you to somebody. We went to the open market, and we had multiple offers come in very quickly for financially simple, heritage business advisors, and heritage investors. I had three primary offers. I didn't choose the biggest one. I chose an offer that allowed me to feel the corporate world a little bit, to mm. step into Because you've never done that. I've never really, done that. Right? I've never been in the bigger businesses. Yeah. You know, I've, I've worked, I've consulted with people sure. in the nine-figure companies, yeah. but I've never personally done that. I was like, yeah. I wonder, challenge, right? <laughs> challenge accepted. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. wonder if yeah. I can take these hometown, country boy, dirt road principles <laughs> and apply it to a much larger business and will it work? Yeah. And so I chose in that moment, my wife and I are talking, our business advisor, my CPA, my attorney, put our team together. We looked at the financials and the data points. It's like, man, this is an unbelievable opportunity. Why don't we sell these three entities? And then the buying entity said, hey, would you come be ultimately the president of this entity and help us drive margins? Yeah. Well, here we are to, taking value acceleration, pushing it into this new buying entity. And within 18 months, after moving some of those methodology around, it transacts hmm. and it sells mm -hmm. for a sizable amount yeah. that I can't yeah. disclose, yeah, but yeah, yeah. sizable amount. And it all comes from what we teach through EPI, what we teach through value acceleration methodology, what Chris, your dad told yep. me on that day that exit planning wow. is good business planning, man, it only works for the landscape company. It also works for the nine figure business out yeah. here. It's amazing that when you step back and just follow the simple processes, it often seems so simple. Yeah. That not only does it impact the consultant or the mm -hmm. advisor, if we're speaking to our yeah. advisors here, yeah. but it also impacts the business owner, the business owner's families. The empl Every one of my employees had a pay increase yeah. whenever they left. Yeah. They now have unbelievable positions. It's it's so powerful, Scott, to sit yeah. back. So, so the whole organization that you had, your whole team, all kind of rose with you in, in, in a sense, we or actually, at least most. Most of them did. We, um, you know, Because whenever you move into an, ex an exit, you're going to yeah. have some synergy issues. Yeah, sure. So we, we retained the individuals who wanted to stay with us, yeah. the ones who wanted to move into that new, new opportunity. Yeah. Um, those who didn't yeah. move on, we helped them get in the right position. That's a pretty short run, right? You said like four years. 48 right? months. Yeah, yeah, yeah four yeah, years. Yeah, four years. And then you were able to grow and sell. I mean, that's a pretty short. I mean, you are right in that Gen X, right? Right. I guess maybe you're the old. You're, yeah. Are you like a, yeah, you're like a true cusper, really? Yeah. But I always say that the people in their 40s and 50s are going to be these boomerang exits. And you were like a pure definition of that. I mean, you started doing that way at a young age. But I mean, four years to me is like a, just a quick exit and a pretty incredible business uh that you uh that you created so i want to talk a little bit about you back as a sepa and advisor now uh and i want to talk about financially simple mm -hmm. uh because i think that uh branding is you're like a king of branding and i think a lot of our sepas and advisors and frankly a lot of business owners have problems with marketing and branding but stick with us folks i'm going to do that when we come back from a quick break Hey there, business owners. Are you ready for a game-changing opportunity? Introducing the 2023 National State of Owner Readiness Report. Over the past decade, this groundbreaking research has reshaped how we view business ownership and exit planning. This report isn't just another study. It's a deep dive into the evolution of business ownership. It shines a spotlight on the crucial intersection of business attractiveness and owner readiness, revealing the undeniable impact of preparation on achieving successful transitions. With younger generations taking the reins, exit planning is taking on a whole new perspective. Education and awareness about preparing for the future have never been more crucial. And with financial readiness leading the charge, there's a clear opportunity for growth and learning. But here's the kicker. The report shows a surge in exit planning education and understanding, yet many still lack formal transition teams, highlighting the essential role of comprehensive support. So who's got your back? Trusted advisors have evolved from CPAs to financial advisors, making a decade of significant change in support networks. Ready to take the next step towards a successful exit? Dive into the Exit Planning Institute's 2023 National State of Owner Readiness Report and start shaping your legacy today. The future is knocking. Are you ready to answer? Discover your readiness level at 2023ownerreadiness.com and take the first step towards a successful and significant exit. Welcome back, everybody, to the Exit Is Now podcast, hanging out with Justin Goodbread. You just give me energy, my friend. You just give me energy. I hope that you guys are all listening and, and, and feeling what I'm feeling. So if you know Justin well inside of the EPI community, 
as an advisor, uh, he had a, a, a brand. There's you just there, there's there's something about it. You're really kind of masterful with it. Uh, financially simple is something that we followed along with as, as well. And and it was funny as you walked into my podcast studio, you like said, "Oh, these are cool." As he was looking at some cameras, and Paige, who helps produce the show, goes. Dude, you're the one that recommended those, right? So we've taken a lot from you uh, and and your kind of thought leadership uh, platform into what we do here at EPI. So kind of unpack financially simple with you with me too, because I think particularly for the financial advisor community as well, it's kind of a hard thing to navigate with compliances and, and things of that nature. So talk to me about how you, how you kind of built it and did it. Yeah, so financially simple was set up as its own entity. Okay. It was owned by our holding company. Okay. Pretty yep. tr- tr- traditional type of structure. Yep. It had one purpose and one purpose only, and that was to attract my frazzled Frank. You know, one of the things that most financial advisors, and I'm going to, you know, yeah. you know, I teach financial advisors. I, I coach know. financial advisors one-on-one now. It's a lot of yeah. fun, yeah. right? But a lot of financial advisors will work with anybody who can fog a mirror. And don't get me wrong. The financial industry is c- tough. It is yeah. tough. Trying to get somebody to trust you with their life earnings is hard. No questions asked. No doubt. But for me, I like you say, I have energy. I, I resonate with a certain type of person. And it's mm. like you, Scott. Yeah. It's, yeah. We, it's like country folk who like to, you know, go hunting, fishing, watch NASCAR, maybe <laughs> listen to country music, yeah. you know, yeah. have a beer, yeah. just just yeah. down to earth. That's yeah. just middle of the country is where I play. Well, that's, yeah. That's, that's your who persona. That's your buyer persona, that's right? That's who you want to work with. So, right? we, so once you outline Frazzle Frank, who he is, and it's about a 16-page document. I mean, I know where he shops. I know his emotional status. I know his various religious. Mm -hmm. I know his political stances, but but everything. I know it all because I've seen this man, right? I know this person. I know what their fears are. I know what their pain points Mm -hmm. are. So I write this thing out. So then it's like, how do I get myself in front of that person? How can I get it, but not for Justin, but for the company that I'm trying to grow value on? Remember, right. everything Heritage, was centered yeah. around how do I build a company highly valued within a short time frame? I've said on stage yeah. at the Exit Planning Conference this last yeah. year, I believe it is easier to make a lot of money in a short period of time than it is to make a lot of money over a long period of time. Mm-hmm. I believe that one person. I proved it, yeah. right? Because yeah, I think there's risk involved. Yeah. It's, it's company-specific risk over a long period of time. So as I'm building this financially simple brand, I'm looking in the marketplace, and at that time, I noticed a couple of holes. I noticed that podcasting at that time did not have many people talking about business planning from a financial perspective, mm. not talking about investments. Frazzle mm. Franks doesn't want to hear about stocks. They don't want to hear about Roth IRAs. <laughs> they don't want to hear about cash balance plans or yeah. life insurance or the disabilities. They want to know how can they, how can they take this largest asset, their business, and move it to the point to where they have freedom. And so here I am doing the exact same thing in my company. And I simply got on the microphone and started talking about what I was doing. Mm. And what transpired was Mm. over that time period is I would talk into a microphone. I hired people to take my content, turn it into a blog post. I hired people to take my content, put it out there in the social, in the, in the digital world through Forbes, Kiplinger, Wall Street journals. I mean, I paid people tons of money. In fact, I'm going to let the cat out of the bag. In that four year period, I spent $1.7 million dollars on Financially Simple, okay? Yeah. So it was not an ROI. So whenever you look at a business- well, it's a marketing engine though, it's, right? It's a yeah. marketing engine, but what think think about the data points though. If you look at it, it wasn't there to, to drive a ROI instantly. Most financial people, I see this all the time, is like, if I'm gonna spend $10,000, when am I gonna break even? Well, mm-hmm. most of the time, you're not going to break even for 18 to 24 months. Right. And so then it's ebb and flow. We see this wave effect. So I simply stepped back and said, how can I take my years of business and consistently do something I like? I like to learn. I like to teach. I like to talk to Frazzle Frank. Yeah. I like to talk about hunting and fishing and yeah. race cars and everything yeah. else. Yeah. How can I incorporate that? And then how can I hire a team around me to take my simple data point, my simple talking to the microphone with whatever I want to talk about that time, and then blow it out, Gary Vaynerchuk style, blow it out across social media, blow it across YouTube, across podcasts, across blogs and articles in speaking venues. And it was magical. So my book, Your yeah. Baby's Ugly, yeah. was simply a podcast that I set out and wrote an outline out for Your Baby's Ugly yep. and said, I'm going to talk about this for the next 60 episodes. I'm going to give my illustrations for the book. I'm going to give everything. So I took the book itself, spoke it into the microphone. The editors then took the transcript, 
turn it to a book, hired the marketing company, and now it's number one bestseller on Wall Street yeah. Journal. Yeah. So to me, financially yeah. simple was, let me do something I love. Let yeah. me connect with this personality, this persona that needs, needs encouragement, mm -hmm. needs inspiration, and needs education. And if I can give away 99.99999% of the data I have, what's going to happen is, and it still to this day is true, I'm going to give away 100%. I still to this day do the same thing. There it takes too much time for somebody to take all the data and then try to apply it. Mm -hmm. So what happens is, as Frazzle Frank would say, you know that point you were talking about, whatever the topic was, hire your spouse at work? Yeah. You know, I've been thinking about that, but if you can help me with this, and you've already talked about these other 700 topics, I need to hire you. What's it cost? Because I don't want to wait 30 years to accomplish this. I want to accomplish it in three years. Hmm. And so now it's say, okay, if you're going to hire us, you would have, we would hire you as a financial planning. You're going to yeah. do financial planning first. First leg of the stool. Let me introduce yeah. you to my team. Yep. And then we're going to work on your business, which is my passion. I want yep. to grow the business. And together, we can double your net worth in 18 to 36 months if you listen and if you apply these principles. So, hmm. for, so financially simple is just an opportunity for me to talk directly to my avatar, let yeah. them hear my message, and then if they wanted to bite, just like that bass man, pull him out from <laughs> that log, <laughs> you're going to throw that lure <laughs> out. He's going to chase it sometimes, yeah. and other times he's going to bite. Yeah, right. And if he bite, I pull him in, and I, we begin working. And we deliver on our promise that, hey, you can take your net worth and double in 18 to 36 months. You can do I it. I think the first thing that really stands out, because well, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to sit here and take in your story and then think about you know, 7,000 SIBAs in the market, right, and how mm -hmm. we could use some of this wisdom uh, across that whole community. And I, the first thing is, is that you are very deliberate and intentional with identifying who you want to work for. You can't go I think, further. Well, th I think anybody, any, I think a lot of us, right? Even businesses outside of the, the education and the community that we're in today, like the landscaping business. At first, I wanted to mow any lawn. And I would say at first I had to, to grow, you know, to grow a little bit of, of cash flow so I could go do other things. But then we got very specific to green and clean and companies that use their image to, uh, sell their products so like a, a plastic manufacturing company. He doesn't care what his grass looks like. He doesn't even mulch his beds, right? So he's not our client. But uh, so I think for the advisors or for the, even for the business owners listening, the first thing that Justin did was stay true to that buyer persona, right? Because you're saying that's who you're kind of selling to. You, you have to, and here's why. The rule of 80-20, Perdeo effect, right? Yeah. So right. the rule of 80-20. So take it, a, take it a step further. Okay. We know that 20% of our clientele produce 80% of our revenue. We know that that's a proven statistic. It falls across every part of life. What if hmm. you look at that 20% and now you apply the 20% to that 20%, you only have 4% of your customers producing roughly about 60-some-odd percent of your revenue. Hmm. Whenever you're looking at that 4% of customers, yeah. you're now saying, if they're producing 60 some odd percent of my revenue, that 4%, I want them because I like them. I don't want all this other noise. And so in order to grow exponentially, you have to know who that 4% is. You have to, or your 20%. You have to know who that ideal target is. And then you have to have the, my, my day say spisma rink. Um, you have to have the gumption. You have <laughs> yeah, to have yeah. the tenacity yeah. to say, no, I can remember one of my family members called me and he said, Hey, I have a portfolio of $64 million. Would you manage it for me? And I said, no. Mm. He said, why not? I said, cause you're not my target. You're not the person I want to help. See, but don't that's you a bold move, man. Like you're true. I mean, that's what I'm saying. You got to stay true. And so whenever you, whenever you can simplify your audience and you know them and you've dwelled more on their problems than they have, whenever they meet you and they know that you know all their problems, yes, dude, they're coming to you. And it doesn't well, yeah. matter at that point what your fee is. It's never an issue about price. No. It's always can you deliver what you said. So now whenever I talk to our SEPAs and I'm like, dude, I was charging in 2000 and, or 2020, mm -hmm. I was charging six figures for financial planning and financial consulting. Yes. And they're like, what? Right. Oh, and that was in addition to my AUM fees. And that right. was in addition to this. And that was in addition. That was just these things. Yes. So it all became that I dwelled on Frazzled Frank's problems more than Frazzled Frank did. And when Frazzled Frank's problems <laughs> arose, I had the solution for them. That's true. That is true. So the other thing that, that, is, that sticks out to me, and if I was one of our, our fellow SEPAs sitting here, I would say, man, it sounds like a lot of your time. So you said $1.7 in four years. What about all the time you spend on this stuff, though? Because I'm saying I know what it takes just to do this 24 or 25 episode podcast, let alone all the other stuff. Like, it's got to take. Well, I guess 
It might not take as much time because I never thought about taking, like, if you had an outline for the book, because my next question to you was you had to have a good, like, partner, like a ghostwriter to, like, put it all together. Well, so let's, let's, let's unpack that. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. in every business is the same. What is our chief goal as SEPAs? And that is to remove the business owner from the epicenter of the business, right? Mm -hmm. If we can get them out of the middle of the business, the business is more valuable and it becomes the golden goose for the person. Mm -hmm. Correct? Yeah. What does it take? It takes systems and processes. Yep. The problem is, is that business owner knows their business too well and they're too talented. They are very talented and they're because of their talent, they're, they're often end up being the, the shoe in or the person that plugs the hole. In my case, hmm. I'm just an old country boy. And I'll yeah. say that now, you, you know, yeah, yeah. I'm an old country yeah. boy born days on a dirt road. Yeah. And you've heard me say that a thousand times. What I learned through my own ignorance is that it's easier for me to hire MBAs than for me to become an MBA. It's easier mm -hmm. for me to hire CFPs than for me to master CFP. It's easier for me to hire SEPAs e than it is for me to master SEPAs. It's yeah. easier for me to hire marketing people. So my job during this 48 month time period was say, set my vision. What is my vision I want to happen? And my vision was, is I wanted to hit a $5 million valuation in seven years. That was my goal, yeah. okay? The team knew I wanted to work with a thousand business owners within a 10 year period of time. We had these, we had the goals nailed down, down to what mm. my day say, the dat and that's ass, yeah, right? I mean, right. down to the pinpoint. So our team knew it, but my job was, is to make sure I had the A players in the right seat. So I did not have to actually do that job. Like you didn't have to do the financial planning. You didn't have to do the business consulting if you didn't want to, right? Correct. You could create content. I create content. So that was your like 40 hour a week, something job, right? It's just to probably do everything that business owners do from visionary and, and, and kind of motivation of perhaps your people. But yeah, you were able to create content. I would put the vision out there. I would let the team put their processes. I use this 313 model, which is, I'm sorry, 131 model. It's like, hey, you're in charge of this. Give me a problem. If you find a problem, give me three solutions and tell me your one solution that you like the best. So use mm -hmm. a 131 model. So they're, as they would come together, they'd say, hey, here's our financial planning process. I said, why wireframe it for me? I have this big glass board in my office. They, I've got a wireframe on there yeah. right now. Wireframe it out. Give me all your auto response emails give me the technology you're going to use show me how you're going to make this automation turn this into a delivery machine in the service industry how do i take my marketing plan turn it into a delivery machine how do i take my consulting turn it into a machine how do i check, create an automation within a very limited position or a limited uh, employee base mm -hmm. so by equipping and empowering and giving the responsibility and authority to the experts that i was hiring paying them premium dollars for them to do their job my job was then to come back and look at here's where we're at today here's the vision that we're going for what's going to prevent us where mm -hmm. i need to be looking 9 10 18 13 16 months down the road in order to make sure that these actions today are not going to hinder the goal. Mm. The problem that business owners have is we can't see past next week. And we start <laughs> Monday off with, here's our plan, and then the phone rings, and it's like, oh, crap, and now I'm goes. a firefighter. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And they can't even get past this to say, to say, hey, how in the world am I going to do this? Right. So what I had the opportunity to do mm -hmm. is I had, remember, I'd already sold businesses, already built businesses. And I'm sitting in a SEPA and Chris says, Chris Snyder says, yeah. exit planning is good business planning. And I went, I wonder if I can take value acceleration methodologies, plural, yeah. methodologies taught plus the previous history. I wonder if I can take this in the financial world, the most regulated industry and build a system that can work without me. And I wonder if I can do it in seven years and I wonder if it'd be worth $5 million. <laughs> okay, yeah. let's yeah. hire a coach. $10,000 yeah. a month coach. You're big on coaches. $10,000 sure. a month coach because I'm dumb. Yeah. I need someone to point my blind side yeah. out. Yeah. Right? So right. I'm huge on coaches. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I, th I want to hire somebody who's better than me, who's been there, done that. The way I describe it is imagine me going to the Rocky Mountains, let's pick Wyoming. The, I've never been to the Wyoming Rocky Mountain range. Hmm. Imagine me going there and trying to kill an elk. I don't know the terrain. I know there's grizzlies there. I know there's wolves there. And I'm going to try to find an elk. No, I'm going to hire a guide. Somebody knows that mountain like the back of their hands right. who knows exactly where the elk are. I'm going to hire a guy. Somebody's been there, done that. Hmm. Because, see, Scott, I learned one yeah. of those principles my dad taught me right. in business is if I want to do something, I can pay for expertise and shorten my runway. 100%. Totally agree. Totally, totally agree. So what I did 100%. is I paid for expertise. Yeah. I shortened my runway. I positioned processes. I cast a crystal clear vision. I put a crystal clear avatar out there. Everybody knew the mission. Everybody knew the values. They had authority and autonomy within the company. And my That's job, critical too. My job was to make sure that the machine was working. Mm -hmm. And so when you build that system out, which it's a system, yes. it takes about 18, 24 months. When you build it, 
it's like the it's like the Apollo series rocket ship it takes 96 percent of the fuel just to get off the launch pad same thing is true with the business <laughs> yeah. same thing is true if you're a, if you're a seeper right now saying dude i want to grow a practice cool Get you a coach. I'm going to tell you, get you a coach. You need somebody that's going to push you just like that old football coach yeah, or soccer yeah, coach yeah, or yeah. whatever the coach whatever is. is. Somebody's going to push you, and somebody's going to know your journey and say, dude, that's going to make it's gonna, you're going you're gonna to miss the mark. So I hired the coach, and I trusted the team, and I just was ignorant enough to trust the processes, and yeah. it worked. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's a lot easier said than done, but it's probably like another podcast in and of itself, right? Like that. what I struggle with in the business even today is that decentralization is actually hard. It's hard. Right? And so I didn't realize it, honestly, in, until we started decentralizing me from the business. So like, I didn't have a, a, I had an appreciation, but not the kind that I have today where it's like Paige, uh, who's our director of marketing, will get it done. She'll get it done likely better than me, but not the way in which I would have done it. And so it's uncomfortable for me. And so I just think that... I, it sounds like you were also masterful at decentralizing yourself and giving that that account we call it accountability with authority to the right people in the right seats along the way so they can make decisions and keep running and the system just keeps going and you're managing the engine. It just May it's, I it's coach cool. you for a second? Sure, please. So whenever you talk like when you say, Okay, I've given Paige who you yeah. and I both loved dear. Yeah. In fact, I walked yeah. in and gave her a hug for yeah. because I yeah. just I love her. Yeah. Um so we know that she's capable of accomplishing that mission, right? 100%. We know that she is extremely talented and she's going to charge hell with a water pistol, as I yeah. say it, to get yeah. the job done because she sees the vision and she knows how she's impacting her mission is, or her job and her role is impacting the universe right yeah. now, correct? If you took a step back and you said, hey, here's how much my time is worth. Mm -hmm. Whatever your time is worth. And you should know that mm -hmm. right now. You probably yeah. don't the way you just roll your eyes, <laughs> but you should know how much yeah. each of your time, each yeah. every minute is worth yeah. for you. You should know how much every minute is worth for Paige. And if you now give her the uh, mm. complete autonomy that she's, hey, you've got this budget, you have this mission, do whatever you want to do, and then step back. Here's what's going to happen. More than likely, she's not going to do it the way you're going to accomplish it or the way you would do it. Yeah. She's not going to do it in the time frame that you're going to expect to be done in. That's okay. She's probably going to spend a little bit more money than what you might imagine it's going to cost because you're ignorant to that particular role. I'm not, yeah. that's not a slam. No, no, it's I, just no, I'm with you. Ignorance unlearned. You haven't yeah, been yeah. studied that, right? Yeah. But sh you trust her. And if you trust your team and you give them that autonomy, that budget, and that freedom, they will deliver. They will deliver because the quality of the culture that you've created. Yeah. So now how yeah. do we do it? Whenever that, that enemy steps upon your shoulder, it's yeah. like, hey, I wonder, yeah. if, I wonder where Paige is at. Yeah. Nah, nah. Yeah. It's now time to call your coach and say, hey, let me talk to you about Paige right now. She's frustrating me because she's three weeks off, to, off the target or she spent $10,000 more or there's a camera that she wants to buy now. And, I'm, and the coach is going to say, do you trust her? Yeah. And then put your money where your mouth is, let her do her job and stand back and watch her work and yeah. watch her sell. Yeah. That's what my coach was telling me because I had the same fears. Scott. That, 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 uh, I mean, that's good advice too, right? Don't call the employee, call your coach, call coach. right? Because if you call Paige, you're just bringing her down. It's like, what a bummer, right? Like, hey, man, you've been letting me run here, yep. and now you're, now you're making me second guess, right? So that's such a good – I think I guess I need a coach too. I don't know if I have a coach. Well, like when I – like a true coach, like a you coach. had a coach. Everybody needs a coach. That you, you could just call up in that scenario and say, man – feeling like I'm going to be like text mastering, you know, mm -hmm. a big text thing to page about where they're going. Don't do that. Call the coach. You I think that's the really coach. good. I think that's really good advice too. We'll have to have you in another episode to unpack that. So we're hitting the top of the hour. So I want to take a quick break, but I want to come back and briefly just talk about what you're doing now, because mm -hmm. I think the SEPA community, the EPI over community overall will be also impacted by it. So I want to talk about that next. So stay tuned. Are you a business owner seeking to unlock the true potential of your enterprise? Look no further than the second edition of Christopher Snyder's revolutionary book, Walking to Destiny, 11 actions an owner must take to rapidly grow value and unlock wealth. In this updated edition, Snyder presents proven strategies for maximizing your company's value and accelerating growth. Whether you're aiming to sell or simply want to ensure long-term success, this book offers a blueprint for building a thriving, self-sustaining business. Walking to Destiny isn't just another book, it's a game changer, backed by Snyder's own experience as a successful business owner and as a SEPA. This book bridges the gap between business owners and advisors, guiding you towards financial freedom. But don't just take our word for it, 
Hear from those whose lives have been transformed by its insights. One satisfied reader raves, the best guide for transitioning out of privately owned companies. I recommend it to all business owners and advisors. Another praises it on its focus for maximizing business value, calling it their, quote, principal tool for educating owners. Ready to take control of your business's destiny? Visit walkingtodestiny.com now and use code EXITISNOW to claim your free copy of Walking to Destiny, 11 actions an owner must take to rapidly grow value and unlock wealth. Don't wait for the perfect moment. Make the moment perfect by seizing this opportunity today. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Exit Is Now podcast. So last segment here, and I wanted to talk to Justin about what he's doing now. I think we'll see it kind of come to life here as, you, as you're as you building it out in, inside of the EPI community and truly living. I think you called it like 3.0, right? Yeah. So And a pretty young guy still. So it's kind of cool to see a I don't know if you call yourself young or not anymore. I'm kind of like I'm hitting 40, so I don't know what to call myself. You know, I don't know when you start saying it. you're older or old. But nonetheless, I think a pretty cool life to be living at 45 years old. So talk to me about what you guys are, are what you're doing now. Yeah. So part of that exit was I sold financially simple. Yes. And then in December, well, last year I acquired it back for virtually nothing. Which is kind of cool. Sold it for seven yeah. figures, got it back yeah. for nothing, right? Yeah. Right. And so I'm taking financially simple, and I'm I'm shifting it around from talking to Frazzle Frank to now talking to the professional community, especially the financial advisors. You know, if you look at the financial advisory space, there's a lot of people who talk about marketing that's never been a financial advisor. There's a lot of people who talk about coaching who's never been a financial advisor. Right. You know, this old saying says, "If you can't do teach," that's yeah. so true. Yeah. I'm somebody who's done it now three times in the financial world and I can read the tea leaves. And so I've taken the financial simple process and I've converted it to value growth Academy. Mm -hmm. So value growth Academy is a subscription model where somebody can come in for a couple hundred dollars a month or one or a 12 month process. And they have a, the, the same exact material that I used in my company is now packaged in a way that they can apply to self pace and then hop on a call once a month through a group Q and a session with a mm -hmm. bunch of comrades. Love, Love yeah. it. And then I have a university program, which is 12 weeks of high intensity. We would call it maybe a, a um, triggering event session, right? Yeah, sure. A high end trigger event session specifically around the financial community on how to take where you're at today. All these things that I'm talking about through a cohort, a, a video style one-on-one -on -one mm. coach or group coaching yeah. over a 12 week program. When you're done, I'm going to rock your world. You're going to take your business to know your pros and cons. Where I want to get to, and this once we get through those, is we have a mastermind where we get financial mm -hmm. advisors who say, hey, look, I have this practice. The practice is worth X. I want it to accomplish Y, and I want to do it within a Z time frame. Right. It's a simple calculation. Well, it's the same thing that you told yourself. Same thing I told myself. Ago. Right, yeah. So if somebody says, I want to have a nine-figure exit, cool, done it. Yeah. Somebody wants to have an eight-figure exit, cool, seven-figure, yeah. whatever yeah. it is. If they want to work for the next 30 years or pass it down to the kids or whatever, I want to get them into a mastermind program to where now we're all saying the same language. We have mm -hmm. everything pulled together. Take it to the next step is now, man, I did this with a dental firm. We did a, what I call a reverse roll-up. We took six different dental practices, kept them separate, they weren't collaborating, they weren't together, and we rolled them up simultaneously to a strategic acquirer. And in doing so, the multiple for this doc, one doc that was my original client, he should have got roughly about a 4x multiple. He ended up getting a 13.2x multiple. He didn't have to increase his revenue that much. We just paired a bunch of people together and rolled up as a, almost like a, a group, a syndication, yeah, yeah, whatever the term yeah, is. Yeah, like, yeah. That happens all the time, but why are we not doing that in the financial space? It doesn't yeah. make sense to me. Yeah. So I want to put together, I'm building right now an active coaching, if you will, program yeah. for financial advisors who say, hey, I'm just starting out. Cool. Let me coach on a monthly basis. Hey, I want to, I want to drive this thing, man. I want to have a, I want to triple, quadruple my net worth in four years. All right, buckle up, buttercup. Yeah, Here we go. We're going to have, I mean, roll your sleeves up. It's yeah. on. Yeah. And then those who say, man, I need somebody who's in the trenches with me, like my coach was, who I could call him and I could, I could challenge him. I could whine on him. He was high second, high half psychiatrist for me sometime. Yeah. You know, he was half my dad sometime. Yeah. He was half, yeah. you know, kicking me in my teeth like my soccer coach yeah, was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to help our financial community because what I've noticed, Scott, is I go back to my original statement. If I had to talk about finances, I'd move to Idaho, sell llamas, and take a fork in my eye. I am not a good technician, in my opinion, despite the awards, despite my skill set. I don't have a passion for the financial world. 
So many of our brothers and sisters out there do, and they are good and they are needed within our workspace, but they don't have the business passion that I have. Mm. And they don't understand the business side of what they have. This thoroughbred racehorse that's literally in the stall kicking, yeah. and they don't know how to ride this thing. Yeah. And so sure. I'm now at the position where my life where it's like, been there, done that. I enjoyed it. It's fun. I dealt with the regulators enough. Uh, six different audits, dude. It, oh. <laughs> yeah. Dealt with the regulators enough that now I can sit back and say, hey, if you as a financial advisor want somebody who has been there, done that, that Wyoming guide who knows where the yep. elk is, who knows how to play the game, who not only knows it academically yep. but has done it, yeah. then let me show you a process. Yeah. And let me show you something, and I will, as long as you allow me to, I'm going to push you, I'm going to drag you, I'm going to get you to where your goal is. Scott, man, that is fun. So between well, it's what you've been doing with the financially simple stuff that we talked about in the other segment, right? When you talked about decentralizing yourself so that you could work on that, you love speaking, you love teaching, you love coaching, and you like building businesses. Yep. So it's really a, a, a nice step. And I think it's something, I mean, you're probably already thinking about how to decentralize this business. What I think has been really cool to watch for you to do is it seems like you're spending a lot more time with family too. Oh, yeah. Right? So as a young, as also a young man, you still have younger kids. So being able to go to Key West for five weeks... Because you've been working, man. Like, you know, like I know many of our baby boomers have been working 40, 40 plus years, right? Maybe even longer than we've been alive. But working as an entrepreneur from 15 to 40 is a, is a, is a big run. Remember that statement I said earlier where it's, okay, now I'm at the phase of my life where I have time. Yes. In front of me, I'm 45. I'm 45 years of age. I don't call myself 45, 45 years, years old, old, right? Okay, I'm 45 years of age. I don't yes. think we're old I yet, like right? Yeah. 45 years of age. I have health. Thank God for that. Yep. And now I have resources, time and money and knowledge and, 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 and. Yeah. How do I take this and now craft a life that is impactful to as many people as possible? Yeah. And when I say that, we have charities now that we work with with our family through our charitable trust that we work with that, that deals with orphanages and things of that nature. Things In fact, that you my guys wife, are passionate about? We have yeah. passion about, dude. I, mm -hmm. I, to go and hold these kids that have gone through some of the worst things that you can even imagine and be able to hold them and love on them and yeah. provide for them is powerful. Yeah. Same time, I have my own children. Mm -hmm. I'm teaching my kids the business side of things. Yeah. So I still love that. Same time, like you and I were laughing, yeah. I just came back from from a four week trip to the keys. And now yeah. Emily and I are going to go somewhere for eight days in yeah. like two weeks. Yeah. Right. You know, it's like, Hey, so have time. I right. still want to have the time with my bride. Right. You know, when, whenever life tempest fugitive, Latin mm -hmm. term time is fleeting. Whenever life, you look at it through the lens of, Hey, you might lose your significant other. Scott, mm -hmm. that was gravity for me. Yeah. hundred percent. And her statement of what's another million dollars going to do for us. Nothing. Right. It's not going to change my, I mean, I'm, I live on a dirt road mm -hmm. and drive F-150, yeah, you know, right, yeah. I love what I do. So yeah. now it's how do I maximize my impact? How yeah, can I take the financial key. community and maximize the impact there? How can I get on stage and maximize the impact? How can I write my New York Times bestseller and maximize the impact? How can I maximize the impact for my children, for my children's children, for the orphanages, for my church? That's where I'm at in my life yeah. right now. And it's a fun place to be. I in. tell you, man, it sounds fun. I got to get there, man. That sounds that sounds fun. Well, I appreciate you quite literally getting off the plane and and coming over to the podcast studio here at EPI HQ to hang out for a little yeah. bit. We talked about going 40 minutes. I think we almost went an hour, but I think that we can we could we have stories for days. Yeah. So uh, thank you guys all for sticking with us and, and tuning in again. Thanks, Justin, for joining us. So subscribe, listen, and leave a review on all of your podcast platforms. We'll see you next time, guys. Thanks.